from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I want to thank everyone for coming on a really hot sunny day like this, uh, especially during your lunch break. Um, and I know it's a work day, most people tend to be busy, so it, it means a lot to us that you've taken the time to come to the library. Um, I'm a very um, also grateful uh, to have here uh, guests and visitors from faraway places. Our guest speaker, Dr. Sunil Sharma, who you'll see has flown all the way in from Boston. Also the lovely uh, staff and students of University of Maryland, uh, Roshan Persian Studies uh, program. I'm delighted that you're here. Um, I, on behalf of the uh, African Middle Eastern Division, want to apologize that uh, the Chief of the Division, uh, Dr. Mary Jane Deep, could not be with us. And uh, Chris Murphy, the head of the section, uh, the Near East section, unfortunately, is out with um, uh, a little illness. Uh, long and short, uh, this is the African Middle Eastern uh, Division's uh, lunch or noon series lecture series that we have. To, right now we are uh, honored to have a series of lectures on the Persian book that are co-sponsored with uh, University of Maryland with a generous uh, funding and support from the Roshan Cultural uh, Heritage Institute in Hawaii. And uh, simultaneously, it is uh, going on at the same time as the Persian Book Exhibition, which is up till September, A Thousand Years of the Persian Book, which has been funded generously through PAIA, the Public Affairs Alliance of Iranian Americans. I would welcome uh, that you go see the exhibition after the talk if you have not seen it so far. Um, the uh, African Middle Eastern Division has three sections, uh, the Hebraic, the Near East, and the African. The Near East section is responsible for a whole series of languages, uh, the Arab world, uh, the largest uh, collections, the Iranian languages, of course, Persian, um, Kurdish, uh, Pashto, Tajik, and um, uh, Balochi, and uh, Turkic languages, um, Turkish, Ottoman Turkish, Azerbaijani, and various Turkic languages of Central Asia, uh, Georgian and Armenian as well. It's a very rich collection. I would recommend that you come and use our materials um, when needed. And the Hebraic section also ties in with the Near East. Uh, we have a number of uh, items that ha have to do with the Coptic and Aramaic speaking populations that are housed in the uh, he Hebraic section along with Hebrew. Um, without taking too much time, I would like to ask Dr. Fatima Keshavars to please uh, come here and speak on behalf of uh, University of Maryland and to introduce our guest speaker. And I'm sure that this will be a very rewarding program for you today. Again, thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Hira, for um, those beautiful, gracious words. It's really a pleasure for um, Roshan Institute for Persian Studies to have been working so closely with the library, with Hirat, with Mary Jane, with Chris, with the whole team. And um, from the moment that over a year ago we planned putting the exhibition together and later on the speaker series, it has been a real rich and uh, learning experience for all of us, and I, we really appreciate that. Um, in particular, I'm very um, impressed with the way the library was envisioning this exhibit in all its broad cultural dimensions, defining the Persian book as it really is to have developed among many uh, cultures that coexisted in the region and not only the nationally defined present day Iran, and uh, rather the constellation of the Persian speaking cultures which uh, explains also our pleasure of hosting Dr. Sharma um, today. Um, again, uh, I would join Hirat to thank the Roshan Cultural Heritage Institute in Hawaii, particularly its president, Dr. Elahe Mir Jalali, who made a special gift to make this um, bi-weekly speaking se speaker series possible, and it's been truly um, enriching for us and for the community of the students, faculty, and, and the community at large. Uh, today, um, we are, um, it, it's really my great pleasure, and we are honored to host Professor Solil Sharma, 
who uh, I w go way back I, when I was hoping to get tenure and he was working on his graduate dissertation um, in the University of Chicago and had returned from Iran and was completely fluent. He really, I, I went there to speak English and he shocked me by speaking such a fluent Persian. Um, so, um, and I spoke actually in the Persian circle, which you organized at the time. So we go way back and it is absolutely delightful to see him to have blossomed into a scholar, a full-fledged scholar. Um, he's currently chair and associate professor of Persianate and Comparative Literature at Boston University. Um, he studied Persian in Tehran and Esfahan and received his PhD in Persian language and literature from the University of Chicago. He was a bibliographer uh, for Persian at Harvard University Library and has held fellowships at the Institute of Advanced Study Berlin, Aga Khan Program in Islamic Architecture at Harvard, the Jawaharlal Nehru Institute of Advanced Study in New Delhi, and the Ecole Pratique in Paris. Um, and I, I have to add here that, as you will, I'm sure, see from the talk, an important aspect of uh, Sonel's work is the uh, significance it gives to the textual, textual documents, to the book, to the creation of the manuscript, and that brings a kind of depth to the scholarship that one does not necessarily always see. He is the author of several books, articles, and translations. He has co-curated exhibitions at Harvard University Library and Sackler Museum on Persian books and paintings. His research interests are in the areas of Persian, Persianet, I should say, literary and visual cultures, translation, and travel writing. It is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Sunil Sharma to the podium. Please welcome him. Drink first. Thank you, Fatima and Hirat, for the invitation um, to come here and for the kind introduction. Um, I wish my Persian was as fluent 20 years later, and because I've not been uh, able to go back to Iran, and I keep hoping one of these days to go there. Um, and I had the good fortune to see the exhibition this morning, and it was absolutely stunned by it. Um, and I really wish it could travel to other libraries. It, you know, it's, I've never seen something like this that combines the manuscript tradition with printed books and um, spanning the entire Persianate world. I mean, it's really um, wonderful that you had the vision to do something like that. Um, my presentation today, and I will try to stay within the time, uh, will be more of a survey because it's difficult to cover a thousand years of um, the Persian book um, uh, in South Asia or India, although it's a thousand years of literature, but um, the fewer centuries of the book. Um, uh, so you'll get a little bit sort of tidbits of all kinds of things, but I'm happy to answer questions um, at the end. Um, a Persian poet at the Mughal court in 17th century Agra wrote the following lines praising a newly produced book in the royal Kitab Khana, the um, Mughal Atelier. He said, um, clinging to each other, calligraphy and painting are in union. The curl of the letter Lam um, is like the tresses of um, the beloved. Picture and writing like form and meaning are joined and as equals have become united in an embrace. And just a line from the original, Tasviro Khat Chu Surat Mani Karin Shod, Baz Ittehad Karde Dar Aghush Ham Makam. Perhaps this poet Kalim was referring to something like this manuscript um, from um, the Mughal Atelier, um, where you see the uh, painting and calligraphy coming together, um, that was produced around the same time in the 17th century. The Persian language and the Persian book had a central place in the social life of pre-modern India. Persian texts played an important role in making large parts of the subcontinent Persianate, both Muslim and non-Muslim communities, as well as transmitting Perso-Islamic ethics and values to the courts of various kings and nobles. 
Thus, the book as a physical object was part of an individual, solitary activity, as well as in a more communal and courtly setting. So if we, um, these two well-known images here, one of the emperor barber reading a book, um, and another of an outdoor picnic, um, a majlis, um, wine and poetry, and you see the book plays, um, it's, it's a central role in these activities. And there are many um, uh, such um, visual kind of um, documents uh, from the Mughal period to show us how books were actually used um, uh, in daily life. The world of books was cosmopolitan to a great degree. The closely connected and far-reaching networks um, for the circulation of texts, whether in an oral or written form, made it possible for a Persian poem produced in Delhi to be read a few weeks later in Isfahan or sung in Bukhara. Given the complex nature of the Persian literary culture, the history of the Persian book in India is both part of the larger story of the production of texts and paintings in the Iranian lands, as well as a distinct Indo-Persian cultural manifestation. So that's sort of my basic thesis that um, the Persian book in India should really be seen as part of a larger history of book production um, uh, in the uh, Persephone world. Um, but within it, you find very much the development of a very regional and distinctive um, Indo-Persian, Indo-Muslim, or Persianate culture. Um, today, I will focus mainly on um, early modern Persian works in the category of illustrated works of Belle Lettre, since it was during the age of the um, so-called Great Mughals, the first um, five Mughals from Babur to Shah Jahan, that more texts were produced in the subcontinent than in Iran. At least that's what we keep hearing. I'm I don't know if anyone's ever done a survey of, um, but, but we, we sort of read and hear this, that um, there, there was more Persian literature and book production. Um, uh, at the Mughal court and various South Asian um, courts than in um, the central Iranian lands. As these images show, the bookmaking arts were held in high regard at the time, and the Mughal atelier was famed for employing the best talent, both local and emigres. Um, and as I said, we have um, lots of visual evidence of this. So here um, on your left, this, uh, these are all very well-known images, but just sort of to emphasize, um, in this manuscript of the Akhlaq in Nasiri, um, you have an um, image of the Mughal atelier of all kinds of activities going on. And then in this one, in Nizamis Khamse, you see um, uh, an artist um, and a calligrapher, but a very um, realistic scene. And that's another um, aspect of the Persian book in India I'm going to refer to today, that the, the kind of realism of um, representation um, in, in um, India. The presence of the Persian language and textual culture in India antedates the oldest surviving books. Um, the old, earliest manuscripts we have, at least literary manuscripts from India, date from the 14th and 15th century, but Persian was already established there since the 11th century. Right from the beginning, the Persianization of the subcontinent resulted in a great mobility of people from scholars, poets, administrators, who carried uh, um, both the repository of their memories and libraries with them. Um, and we have anecdotes of um, uh, uh, people who fled, for instance, Central Asia, the Iranian lands, um, during the Mongol invasion and came to India and said, I lost my library on the way. I think Aufi um, says that. Um, um, uh, so, so as these people came to the subcontinent, they um, most certainly brought books with them and. Um, uh, as well as other objects. Along with individuals, then there was this exchange of um, uh, objects between Central Asia, Ottoman Turkey, India, and Iran. Um, one of the best known episodes in this history is the historical so sojourn of the Mughal Emperor Humayun in the 16th century at Shah Tehmas, Tehmas court in Kazvin in 1544 from um, where he returned with two painters, Mir Sayyad Ali and Khwaja Abdus Samad, initiating the highest point of the history of cultural exchange between the Safavid and Mughal empires. 
Similarly, in the field of literature, especially during the reigns of the three greatest Mughal emperors, Akbar, Jahangir, and Shah Jahan, scores of Iranian literati and scholars traveled to India, whether for reasons of better prospects of patronage um, or um, just for uh, religious freedom that existed at the Mughal court. But uh, this high um, degree of mobility resulted in a very vibrant culture of the book. The chief category among Persian books circulating in India was um, we, what we would call the copies of the Persian classics, whether produced in India or locally. So um, uh, the desire to be well-versed in the Persian classics was expressed at the highest level, right from the emperor. Um, the Mughal court historian um, Abul Fazl informs us that the emperor Akbar was fond of listening to classical Persian works, um, especially during his uh, bedtime. So he, one of some of his favorite works were the Akhlaq e Nasiri, um, the Kimya e Sadat of Al Ghazali, the Qabus Name, the Letters of Sh um, Sharaf Maneri, the Gulistan of Saadi, and here's the really exquisite. Um, uh, Mughal um, Gulistan, now the Royal Asiatic Library, um, the Hadika of Sanai, um, the Masnavi Manavi of Maulana Rumi, the Jami Jam of Ohadi, Bustan of Saadi, Shahnameh of Firdosi, Khamse of Sheikh Nizami, and um, yeah, I think, no, I don't have an image, the Kulyat of Ami Khusro and Maulana Jami, the Divans of Khaqani and very and so on. So you see the entire kind of um, the canon of classical Persian literature is um, present here and many of these texts were produced um, at the Mughal court. Um, uh, Saadi's Gulistan, of course, is, is sort of the standard textbook for students of Persian all over the Persophone world. It remains so far, you know, until modern times. Um, and um, uh, so right from the, the top level of the Mughal court with the emperor, you have this interest in, in the Persian sort of past, the literary past. Um, and um, we see that uh, as uh, provincial princes and governors and other nobility, they imitated the lifestyle and tastes of um, the, the imperial family that they would um, uh, the taste in these um, classics would trickle down to the provinces, and that's why when we um, when we talk about Mughal manuscripts and books, um, you, you might see. And I found it confusing in the beginning, always, you know, because in literature we don't do that. But with art history, the imperial style and the provincial style, I think it's, um, and it, it also tells us a lot about reading and the dissemination of um, kind of literary culture. One of the most precious books for a number of reasons was the great, of course, 11th century epic by Firdosi, the Shahnameh, and there are lots of copies in your exhibition here. Um, although there were copies of this work made in India from the earliest, uh, early Islamic times, um, illustrated manuscripts date only from the 15th century, and this, just to give you an example how distinctive these early Shahnames are, um, and they are kind of here, you um, uh, uh, have uh, something in the, what's called the Jainesque um, uh, uh, style, which uh, is similar to the uh, Jain manuscript painting in Western India from 15th century. Um, um, but it was not just Indian-made manuscripts of the Shahnameh that were prized. One of the most Mughal-valued uh, um, uh, possessions in the Mughal library was a copy of the Shahnameh produced for the Timurid prince Muhammad Juki um, in circa 1444. Um, here's a, a, an inscription uh, from that. It bears the ownership seals of five emperors, including those of Babur, who originally brought the manuscript from Herat to India, Shah Jahan, whose handwritten note, this is in his handwriting, um, about the manuscript entering the royal library on the day of his accession to the throne is included. Such books, therefore, were an important component of imperial pride for the rulers. Scholars are faced with the puzzling problem of few copies of the Shahnameh produced um, at the Mughal court. Um, but we know that there were lots of copies produced in Iran that were present, and that's sort of a, a separate issue of um, um, why, with all this interest in the Persian classics, we don't have Mughal copies of the Shahnameh, because I think they really valued these older um, copies um, that had family connections with the Timurids. 
Um, the Shah Nami made a very good, good gift among royals because of the theme of kingship. Uh, uh, it, it was something um, that could be given as a gift, a very um, uh, you know, so fine copy of the manuscript. Uh, for example, in his memoirs, Jahangir writes that in 1622, um, I viewed the Shah Nami and a Khamsa of Nizami illustrated by master painters along with other pres presents sent by Mustafa Khan, governor of Tatta, as an offering. Um, another copy is a large illustrated manuscript of the work that was personally presented to the Emperor Shah Jahan by Ali Mardan Khan, um, the Iranian uh, Safavid who defected to the Mughal side in 1637 after um, the Mughal victory in Kandahar and who went on to become the governor of Kabul and Kashmir. So um, uh, anecdotal kind of evidence like this shows that gift giving and um, uh, uh, played a very big role in the circulation of books and in book culture um, in India in those um, centuries. Along with uh, copies of the Shah Nameh of Iranian provenance, there is also evidence for the um, existence, as I said, of an Indian-oriented trend in Shah Nameh painting. Um, we saw this one, the Sultanate uh, one, but um, uh, 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 for a Mughal copy, I said there are very few complete Shah Nameh. There's just one leaf here, and here this is, uh, whoops, <laughs> should I, yeah. Um, this is sort of what you would expect to see, Akavon, Deev, and um, Rostam. Um, I think there's a, another um, painting of this in the exhibition. And here in a Jahangir period painting from the Chesterbeti Library, um, you have this remarkable kind of um, Akavon Deev is um, shown as an elephant. Um, and, um, and as I said, we only have this one painting from the Shah Nameh. If, um, you know, um, I don't know if others exist or if a, a full copy ever existed. Um, the striking and unique representation of Akavan Deev as an elephant is a continuation of the trend of blending Indian and Persian iconography um, in uh, paintings of this time um, and perfectly signifies the Shah Nameh's value in the eyes of a large section of Mughal society as a book of tales that had resonances in Indian stories as well. And this is something I've written about that um, the Shah Nameh had a very different significance, uh, at least for the Mughals, um, than it did for say Iranian rulers in, uh, in Iran or Central Asia. Um, uh, it, it was seen as a book of stories and the physical book was valued, as I said, for instance, Timurid copies. Uh, but, the, but the whole thing of kingship, um, it, 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 because it, it's not about Iran, the story is an epic of, it, it's not about India, it's an epic of Iran, um, that it, it had um, the significance in that regard wasn't as great. Um, imitations of Firdosi's epic were produced by court poets at Indian, um, at various uh, uh, Indian uh, courts as they were um, in Safavid Iran, substituting the martial victories of contemporary uh, figures for the exploits of traditional heroes. These works, however, are only related in form to the Shah Nameh. They follow the meter, the Mutakharib, um, and, um, and are not always spin-offs of the original tales. Um, several condensed versions of the Shah Nameh in prose or mixed prose verse also appeared at various times. Uh, so actually we have evidence from the earliest times of um, selections from the Shah Nameh produced in, uh, in India, the Ikhtiarat Shah Nameh from Ghaznavi times to others. But one of the most popular was a work, um, the Tariq -e Dil Gusha or Tariq -e Shamshir Khani by Tabakkul Beg. Um, produced for the governor of uh, Kabul in Shah Jahan's time. And in the introduction, he says that his patron says that, who has time to read such a long work? Why don't you, um, you know, summarize it for us? Um, so this work, uh, the, 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 the author, Taba Kolbeck, uh, chose the best kind of uh, parts of it with his own prose kind of um, uh, 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 linkages between various uh, quotes from the Shah Nameh. And interestingly, the, um, it only includes the mythological part of the Shah Nameh that shows that a large part of the Shah Nameh, the, especially the Sasanian part, was not of interest to um, uh, Mughals, or at least at this uh, period of time. 
Um, we know that the Emperor Akbar was particularly fond of listening to stories from the Hamza Nama, um, the popular romance of the uh, Prophet Muhammad's uncle, Amir Hamza. Um, such tales provided entertainment, not only when the court was, is, was in residence in the capital city, but while on the move. Um, the historian Abul Fazl again writes that after a hunting expedition in Malwa in 1564, for the sake of delight and pleasure, Akbar listened for some time to Darbar Khan's recital of the story of Amir Hamza. Akbar is said to have liked this work so much that he even um, recited it in the style of professional storytellers in the palace. So there was a culture of orality as well as of um, uh, the book um, within the palace and outside. Um, it was the extreme enjoyment of the emperor in listening to this narrative work that led to the production of a lavishly illustrated manuscript. And just an um, uh, example of this uh, um, is uh, the Hamza Nama. These um, are well known, of course. There was a major exhibition of this a few years ago in, um, uh, at the Met. Um, and um, and the, uh, the text actually of this work has been less uh, worked on than the images, um, but it was certainly a very important, uh, another one of those very um, important uh, works uh, for Indo-Persian, Indo-Muslim uh, cultural identity that passed on to um, uh, later um, versions in Urdu and other languages. And I think I skipped this. I wanted to just show, um, this was an example of another kind of um, uh, a story of a canonical work, uh, the Yusuf and Zulekha by Jami, how of uh, so-called provincial works, this is a manuscript from Kashmir at the Walters, um, uh, you can see the kind of um, difference um, in style, obviously, but um, what you also find is that, that there are many more um, paintings and illustrations added to, um, at least I found for the Yusuf and Zulekha manuscripts of Jami that were produced in um, various provincial courts in India. Um, perhaps because people again did not want or have time to read the entire text and could access the story through paintings and images like this, because these, especially this scene of the seduction, the attempt of um, uh, Zulekha trying to seduce Yusuf is a well-known episode. Um, so here you have uh, 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 Herat, uh, kind of the same scene from Abu San of Saadi at the Cairo library um, uh, that again is well known, but then how it, it then gets transferred to a very so-called provincial style. Um, in contrast, the Emperor Shah Jahan, um, his taste in bedtime listening was very different from that of his grandfather Akbar. And one of the historians um, tells us that um, so that his majesty may fall into a sweet sleep, the eloquent members of the assembly read behind the veil works on biography and history, um, such as the uh, memoirs of the emperor Babur, his um, great, great grandfather. Um, here is a, a Mughal copy of the Babur Nama. Um, and so Shah Jahan was really interested in such kinds of historical works and the Zafar Nama. Um, uh, about the conquest of um, uh, Timur uh, and other ancestors of the, um, theirs. Um, thus, history rather than poetry or narrative tales interested Shah Jahan. Um, each of these early emperors had an active personal role in determining the kind of books that were produced in their Kitab Khanes, thus setting trends that trickle down to the regional or provincial level. So I think it's very important to also um, uh, look at the personal taste of patrons and, and especially the emperors who were the, the biggest patrons at certain times to see how they influenced um, the, the production of books and reading tastes of each period. Over time, as the Mughals expanded the frontiers of the empire and became more multicultural, Akbar's interest shifted to the Indian, that is the Sanskrit classics, um, and there was a huge um, project of translation um, um, that took place at court. The Mahabharata, the Sanskrit epic, was translated into Persian during the years 1582 to 84 um, uh, with the participation of Nakib Khan and the um, historian Badawni. And the imperial illustrated manuscript was executed in 1586. And after that, um, the translation of the other Sanskrit epic, the Ramayana, was undertaken in 1584 and finished 
um, four to seven years later, um, about which the historian Badawni says that this is a superior composition to the Mahabharata, but it is clear that either these events are not true and this is a mere tale and pure imagination like the Shah Shahnameh and the stories of Amir Hamza, or, or else they must have happened in the time of the dominion of the beasts and the jinns. So this you know, equa um, equation of all these works, the Shahnameh, the Mahabharata and Ramayana as the book of stories, um, it's very sort of interesting, and Amir mean, Hamza, to, to lump them all together. It's kind of a book of stories. So here's just an example of um, one of the, um, uh, an image from a, a Razm Name that was the Persian title of the translation. Um, <clears throat> indeed, even those who were favorably, favorably disposed towards one or the other tradition, that is the Persian or the Indian, would have been aware that the Sanskrit and Persian epics shared elements in common. The Ramayana has, you know, the Rakshasas, the, the Persian Deeds, etc. And artists were not oblivious of, I think, um, this similarity. So you see again the same image of Akhavan Deev, and here are the, the Rakshasas from um, uh, the uh, Ramayana, the Free Ramayana here. Um, and you see kind of similarities. And actually, if you look at a number of these, you see that. Um, a very interesting kind of um, linkage is maybe perhaps in the minds of the artists, but I think also um, with respect to the text um, as well. This was, of course, part of Akbar's program for a dialogue of re religious communities at a literary and visual level. And the book really, I think the Persian book, plays an important role in this kind of um, uh, uh, dialogue between the Hindu um, and uh, Muslim uh, uh, communities in pre-modern India and as well as other religious communities like the Sikhs, uh, etc. Um, and we also have other works so apart from the Mahabharata and Ramayana. There were um, romances um, of Indian origin that were translated into Persian or versions um, into a Persian form were produced. So for one of the very well-known ones and very uh, I think widely read at that time and later is um, the, the court poet of Akbar Faizi, the brother of the historian Abul Fazl, um, his uh, Naldaman of um, the romance of Naldaman in the same style as uh, Khusro Shirin or Leili Majnoon. Um, it, it's a romance, um, um, uh, this is from the British Library. Um, and um, this was a work um, produced, uh, written and produced at uh, Akbar's court and remained popular. Um, and it was only one of many um, stories or lo of local legends or of from Indian um, kind of tradition that were put into Persian form um, to, to kind of, again, bring the traditions um, together. Um, while these works like the Nal Daman and um, Hamza Nama are not original works, meaning they derive the, the plots and stories derived from older um, Sanskrit or Persian or Arabic traditions, um, another Mughal verse romance with the title uh, Suzo Godaz, Burning and Melting, this is, I have, uh, sort of obsessed by this work by the poet Noe, who was an Iranian emigre at the Mughal court um, at the end of Akbar's court, um, time in the um, 16th century, um, is, um, uh, is, is an original work that sought to exploit his Indian environment. And it is really basically, again, the story of uh, a Masnavi in this, about two lovers, but at the center of this story is an episode of Sati, which is um, where uh, uh, an Indian Hindu woman burns, cremates herself on the um, the f uh, funeral in, in the uh, you know along with her dead husband um, as a show of devotion. And here, this manuscript um, produced um, at that time of Noe's work, um, you have Prince Daniel, um, Akbar's son, supervising um, this um, this sati. Um, and this is a demonstration of Mughal kind of tolerance of Indian practices. Um, and this is a Safavid manuscript um, of the same, I think, so the Chester Beatty Library of the same work. Um, and interestingly, this work was very popular for various reasons in Safavid Iran as well. Um, and right in the beginning of this, uh, this romance, Noe says that 
Um, how long do we have to hear the old stories of Farhad and Shireen and Leili and Majnoon? And it's time for something new. And, and we know, as uh, I was discussing with Kevin, that this, this whole idea of Taze Gui or doing something fresh um, that, you know, which we associate with the Ghazal um, was also happening in the Masnavi poet, poets talk about, let's do something new. Um, uh, so this, this work is it, it's quite um, uh, remarkable in that sense. And I think it would also have appealed um, to people sort of with a Persianate sensibility because the whole idea of burning in the fire, obviously, for, for those of us who know the tradition, is very similar to the, uh, that image of the, uh, the sham and parvone. So the Hindu woman is often compared to the parvone who, um, you know, she uh, annihilates herself. Uh, in the f uh, flame for love. Um, if we can say, I mean, this is a romance, but, and, and you know, I'm not going to get into this uh, 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 sort of investigating whether Noe really s witnessed such an event or not, but it really is also part of what I call the representing the real um, uh, in, in um, these uh, uh, manuscripts and works of this time. Um, we see already um, with uh, this man, these images that um, we see the Emperor Babur here entering a garden, uh, supervising the laying out of the Bagh -e Vafo in Kabul. Um, and you have um, other kinds of images from the Chronicle Akbar Nameh. Uh, you have the building of um, Agra. We have uh, paintings of the building of Fatehpur Sikri, etc. Um, these kinds of images of everyday life um, of ordinary people, I think that's very, very um, uh, kind of particular to um, this period um, and to the Mughals. Um, and they offer a realistic representation, um, although within, obviously, uh, uh, the idiom of whatever kind of um, style they were painted in, but, but there's an attempt um, to be um, kind of um, real. And um, uh, many such paintings are found in albums in the Muraka, which are also part of book culture that we should consider. Um, and um, uh, these were produced all over the Mughal um, um, capitals um, in Agra, Delhi, and Lahore. Um, especially we see sort of scenes of urban activity um, in, these, um, in these kinds of um, manuscripts and albums. Uh, and this, uh, I think some of you know, one of my, uh, here's one actually of uh, the celebration at Jahangir's accession from the Jahangir Nama, um, uh, I think in the St. Petersburg album. Um, and you actually you know, see kind of, um, it's really a vignette of not just um, an urban kind of, um, the urban um, uh, landscape, but um, um, the diversity of the population. This is something that you see in Mughal um, literary texts as well, the emphasis on um, the kind of the multicultural and the, 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 you know, the diversity of the empire and kind of uh, this coexistence, the, the sole kol, I suppose, of, um, of, uh, um, of the Mughals. Um, and then this one um, is also another form of, um, I would say, sort of recording historical moments that you find. Um, uh, this is, of course, an imaginary meeting um, of Shah Abbas I and Jahangir, um, but um, it, it marks a certain kind of symbolic um, um, event of the coming together of the two cultures. But the painting on the right at the, uh, from the MFA um, uh, at, in Boston of um, the Mughal embassy in Isfahan, um, 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 meeting Shah Abbas is actually the recording of a historical event. Um, so, so it's it's you know th these these representations are metaphoric at some level, but they're also very very historic. Um, done by the artist Bishan Das, who had um, uh, gone to Iran with the embassy um, in the 1610s, um, and then this is a, a one of my favorite uh, paintings uh, from the. Uh, Asiatic society as well, um, of an indoor majlis of a Mughal governor, Zafar Khan, who was of Iranian origin, and the court poets of Shah Jahan, musicians, Bishandas, the artist, and just an indoor setting. 
And, you know, it, we have many paintings like this, obviously, but when you can actually contextualize um, um, such paintings to occasions, so this comes from the, a, a manuscript of the governor's own um, Masnavi's uh, poems, narrative poems written about his life in Kashmir. Um, so the paintings, like his poems, testify to the attachment of the governor to the place um, and really record kind of, a, it's a record of, um, of his time in Kashmir. So um, part of you know, what I call this um, realistic um, representation. Um, in contrast, such realistic representations of daily life um, are almost non-existent in Safavid manuscript painting. Um, despite the existence of a shared literary culture and movement, as I mentioned, of poets and texts between Iran and India, Safavid and Mughal poets and artists develop different forms of representation. So I think that's very um, interesting um, uh, to, uh, you know, to observe that the same text can, can be illustrated or used in very different ways depending on um, where it is. Um, um, visual or literary rep representation in the Iranian context remain much more metaphorical and idealized um, as opposed to the mimetic quality of um, uh, these uh, Indian objects. Um, another um, object of this nature, historical, is the famous um, uh, Padshaname, the Windsor Padshaname. Um, this one, of course, is from the 17th century. In the exhibition here, you have the lovely uh, 19th century um, copy um, here, uh, which it, it was uh, wonderful to see. Um, and this also um, marks kind of this uh, recording of, um, of symbolic and uh, major occasions. Um, and, and this manuscript is particularly interesting um, uh, for those of you who know it, that uh, it illustrates um, episodes from the, the early reign of Shah Jahan um, and battles, etc. that we have lots of poetry about those same things so that you can actually compare poems written about a battle or an event with a painting. Um, and then, of course, look at the chronicle or a history so that history, painting, poetry, they are all working in tandem in Shah Jahan's time to represent kind of major um, scenes um, from his um, rule. And um, much of this poetry actually was written by his poet laureate, Kalim um, uh, Hamadani, an Iranian emigre poet at his court, uh, with whose um, lines I began um, my presentation. And um, he has, uh, I'll just read this, I know I'm running out of time, um, but um, these lines from his, um, um, uh, from his uh, poem commemorating the creation of this object, or the Padshanama, he says, it's, it's just, I mean, it's, it's amazing that he writes a poem about the creation of a book. He says, look at this Padshah Nama with an intelligent eye, for it is a model of the feasting and fighting of emperors. Before wisdom's face, its pages are mirrors whose truthful reflection is like the shining sun. From its cypress lines in the garden of the narrative of events, the sign of true discourse is manifest. Its contents are free from the bombast of secretaries. It is as if it came from the unseen world. There is no dust of mendacity on its battlefield. It is awash with blood from the cloudy sword. The garden of its feasting is not watered by sincerity. A paradise, how could its freshness, freshness be from rain? Defeat does not enter the corners of its folios on the pages that are the exploits of the king of kings, Shah Jahan. So you have this kind of wonderful sort of union of all the, the book arts um, that come together um, in Shah Jahan's reign. Um, and I will show just a few images quickly of the more Mughal, what I have um, written on um, uh, ethnographic representations. The Mughals were also very interested in the world around them, um, the sort of the, especially holy men. And here you have um, two kinds of representations of holy men with text. These would have been um, albums from album pages. Um, here you have collection groups of people, which is really, if you look at the margins of this manuscript, you, each character is an individual 
different kind of, you can identify perhaps with a Sufi order or a kind of um, uh, a, a holy figure, and then just ordinary people in a camp. So um, this uh, by the artist Govardhan, um, uh, this, this kind of, again, interest in the, the unusual. Um, and here, because this is, of course, well known as well, but because this is about the history of the Persian book, you see in the margins all the different kind of activities associated with making a book um, that we have, you know, such a... And, and I think especially these um, kinds of album pages with groups of figures, um, you really, you, uh, we can think of communities of people working together um, uh, and look at the whole group together rather than as individuals. Um, and because your exhibition also has a section on uh, uh, women, um, uh, uh, the books by women writers of Persian, I wanted to... Um, um, well, I'll rush through it, although I, I would uh, give more time to it. It's a very important subject. Um, that women and uh, books um, uh, were uh, in the Mughal um, harem were um, connected, of course, and we have this uh, uh, painting from the Royal Asiatic Society of, of uh, perhaps a, a classroom in the Mughal harem with prince princesses um, and their chaperone in the background. Um, we have... Um, one of the earliest uh, writings uh, of, uh, by a Mughal woman was um, this uh, uh, Humayun sister, Gulbadan Begum, her Humayun Name. This is the uh, only manuscript in the British Library. Um, Princess Jahanara, the sister of Prince Darashiko, the daughter of uh, Shah Jahan, was also an author. Um, her work this on um, the Sufis of the Chishti order, the Munis al Arwa. Um, um, this is also in the British Library, um, is um, well-known work and one of the few from the early modern period of prose work by a woman writer. Um, this is, I, you, I know you have the Tajik book in the exhibition, um, and the Divan e Mahfi, the Princess Zebun Nisa, daughter of the Emperor Aurangzeb, and a, a manuscript of her works. Of, this is from the British Library, but um, these are actually quite uh, common from the 18th century. Uh, Zebun Nisa's uh, or Mahfi's poetry was read very widely across the, the Persian world. And um, you have, I just wanted to give you examples of how beginning in the late six, um, um, 17th century and then really in the 18th century, Hindu writers of Persian works come um, into prominence. Earlier we had um, sort of more the Indian uh, the, uh, the Muslims, sort of uh, like Faizi writing, Masnavis. Here you have Anandra Mukhlis, his Karname Ishq is a, a romance in mixed uh, uh, verse and prose, um, had a wide um, readership, um, but Hindus were also involved in um, commentaries, and especially commentaries on classical Persian works, dictionaries, treatises on literary criticism were very, very um, uh, frequently produced in the 18th and um, 19th century in India, often by Hindu um, writers of Persian. This is a, a commentary on Saadi's Bustan. Um, the parts in red are the lines from Saadi and then the commentary of Tekchan Bahar, who also wrote a Persian um, um, dictionary. Um, and I think, yes, I'm uh, coming to the end. Um, to show an example, in the 19th century, you have another kind of um, sort of, uh, uh, in the Persian book, an, another kind of uh, example um, by the uh, uh, James Skinner, known as Sikandar Sahib. He was a, of um, half uh, um, British and half Indian origin. Um, and this, I wanted to show at least one something from the Library of Congress collection. Um, this is, a, um, a, you know, as you can see, a painting of a hajjam, a barber, um, and this is from the Tashriul Akwam. It's a, a book of um, the various castes and um, um, social groups of the and tribes of the um, of Indians from a particular region in the north. Um, um, but it's really a continuation, in in some sense, the British. Um, um, kind of uh, patronage and production of such manuscripts is a continuation of older Mughal traditions, but now combined in an, um, you know, with this impulse to really be scientific and observe the society around them very objectively. 
The 19th century, of course, saw the introduction of lithography, both in Iran and India, but especially um, in India, um, we have the Kalila wa Dimna of Nasrullah Munshi um, and then Divan of Hafiz. This is where we can see Western bookmaking um, um, uh, has a, uh, an influence here because title pages start appearing on lithographs, and that's something that comes from the European um, book, of course. Um, and uh, the, this work that I mentioned earlier, the prose um, and mixed prose and verse summary of the Shahnameh, it became the basis of translations of the Shahnameh into other Indian languages. So the Gujarati Shahnameh and the Punjabi Shahnameh lithographed in the 19th century are really not Firdosi's original, but translations of the Tarikh del Gusha. So people wanted the summary, not the, the whole thing. Um, and of course, uh, the two last great poets uh, of um, India, and uh, uh, you know, Ghalib, the last Mughal poet, and uh, Muhammad Iqbal, the, just the last Persian poet. Well, the last, I mean, is anybody the last, right? But the last great poets, and, um, and uh, uh, you, uh, it marked the end of Persian um, in India, symbolically. And I thought I would um, kind of show you this. Um, imagine noon mourning over Leila's grave, or we can mourn the loss of Persian in India. Um, but I wanted to end with a positive note and say that all is not lost because we have various projects in India now. There's kind of a renaissance of Persian um, publishing, scholarly publishing, not for a commercial or general readership, but one of them is the Khaneye Farhang in New Delhi. They've been doing editions of lots of Indo-Persian texts, which is really amazing with wonderful uh, scholarly editions. And then the Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts, they have a, a, a project of preservation and producing texts um, and facsimiles um, of um, uh, Persian works, especially works like this, a musical text in Persian, or the Ramayana, or one of the Ramayanas in Persian, that are very, very, um, I think, specific to the Indo-Persian heritage um, and uh, the cultural kind of past, um, which would otherwise be lost today. But um, I think the Persian book lives on in India. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful lecture. We really learned a lot. One, it's amazing the range of material you went through. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Feel free to ask any question you would like. We are recording, filming the program. Um, if you ask us a question, uh, just be aware that you're giving us consent to film you and then subsequently show you as a webcast program. Thank you. If you have any questions, please get up and ask. Look forward to it. Thank you. The family. Yes. Realistic, they're set up in certain times to see movements that you don't see in their, their Persian counterparts or the kind of over idealized version. Um, can you say a little bit about the way the artists work? Is this like, are there particular schools that seem to have very distinct and different ways of approaching the illustration of manuscript? Are there, you know, what, how do they come? Right. Well, I'll attempt to answer that question briefly. You have two experts sitting on either side of you who would know better. Um, but um, as, as I mentioned, um, uh, the whole kind of the Mughal, um, you know, uh, atelier sort of, you could say, got a new impetus from the artists who came from Iran. So you see that, you know, there's kind of a much more um, Iranian or Safavid style paintings um, 
Um, and then really what I think I refer to too as the, the, the taste of patrons, you know, it's very interesting that they, you know, artists often responded to um, uh, tastes of patrons that if Akbar was really interested in the um, Iranian world, um, you know, his uh, uh, artist would then, um, even when they were illustrating books that was from the Persian classics, like it's it's kind of interesting even, you know, with the Shah Nameh or the Divane Hafiz, which was illustrated at the Mughal court, to see very Indian style painting in text that you connect so much with Persian culture um, that, um, but then each of the artists, I think also had very kind of distinctive tastes and they, they brought different things um, uh, to, to I think the execution um, of the painting and, um, and the whole question of how much were they reading the text, how much was explained to them. It depended on the individual, you know, what they thought they were illustrating. So that there's a whole range, I think, of, of paintings um, there. And, 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 but I think it's very important to remember that whether patron or poet or painter, we must really keep the individual um, in mind, their taste, their idiosyncrasies, their particular kind of, I mean, these are people. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. You mentioned a couple of times Islamo Persian. Uh, what are, in the context yes. of what you presented, what is the Islam? Um, it's sort of the the Islam uh, for a, a, a large part of um, South Asia was filtered through um, Persian um, uh, text. So when Islam first, uh, you know, was uh, came to I- I the Iranian lands and works of ethics and um, you know mirrors for princes, etc., for Muslim rulers were produced, like the Qabus Name or then the Akhlaq and Nasiri, etc with, um, you know, whose background was Arabic, Islamic kind of uh, values and, um, you know, um, ethics. And then these were brought to India through Persian. So um, a lot of these ideas were not accessed in India directly uh, in Arabic, but through their Persian counterparts. In some narratives, what the Arabs wrote was not brought by way of mirrors for princes and advice. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So that, that's what confuses me about the Islamness of, uh, right. of this. Uh, well, I guess it would refer to a historical moment that someone reading, say, the Kalila wa Dimna, you know, uh, uh, in, in Persian would might know of the Arabic Ibn Muqaffa's translation, but may not be aware that there's a longer history behind this. Um, you know, so uh, texts and, you know, all these... Um, these works travels back and forth so many times, the Arabian Nights, and the origin in India and Iran as well. So, but I see your point, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, do you want to moderate? You, you go first and then. Uh, uh, how politicized is acknowledging and researching the history of, uh, or the influence of Persia and this Persian text uh, in India's greater history? Um, I think um, it can become politicized, but I think it's indispensable because especially for, you know, these kind of middle centuries, the, um, if you, we can call it medieval and early modern, that so much of history, cultural, political history is only available in Persian texts that, you know, and um, uh, that, that you cannot do without them. And I think um, in today's kind of, um, if you're talking specifically about the Indian context, um, uh, you know, there's uh, whenever the Indians officially at least talk about the Mughals, it's always Akbar and his emphasis on, um, you know, bringing communities together, composite culture. I think by talking about that, um, it, it diffuses kind of other sort of, um, uh, communal tensions in India, but uh, and a lot of this these works are, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of secular. I mean, they were written, you know, um, uh, the poetry, um, historical texts, etc. So um, I think um, they they can avoid those kinds of um, questions. Yeah. Yes.
Yes. Yes. Yes. No, no, okay. It, it, the Mahabharata means great India, you know, it's the, epic, the battle for India that takes place. But I think it gets translated as the Razumname, the book of war, uh, because like the Shahname, it's, you know, uh, Razmobasm in the Shahname, it's seen as an epic basically to use again a, a category from another tradition, but um, it's seen as an epic. So again, as I was saying, these works get equated together as just books of stories and exploits. Um, and your first question with the Zoroastrian heritage, of course, I left that out because that's a whole different kind of, you know, the and your exhibition, I think, does it wonderfully address the role of the the Zoroastrian book. Um, um, uh, yes, the Persian was very important for that community, and they did interact uh, with others, obviously. Um, uh, but largely, um, the Persianization of South Asia did not take place through Zoroastrian communities or their books, but through these kinds of Mughal um, rulers, the provincial governors, et cetera, administrators. Um, so th that's why I left out. Uh, the Shahnameh was, of course, very important for them. So in the, you know, there are many um, uh, sort of versions or, or uh, copies of the Shahnameh in the Zoroastrian community um, and the, the famous 19th century lithograph in the exhibition produced in Bombay with kind of, um, uh, you know, images of Zoroaster and a history of Parsi notables. So they do enter this story of the, um, the Persian book in India, but um, just had to leave something out. Yeah. Yes, and, and yes, it has to be, I think, in individual cases, you know, you, you can't make, uh, um, I, I guess, blanket statements about all kind of books or, you know, the, the entire book culture. Um, so as I, a couple of examples I gave, Ferdowsi Shahnameh had a specific valence for um, Mughals or Indian rulers. Um, and if a book, you know, depends on who gave it, where it had been, whose seal it had, you know. Um, but th it, does that have something to do with the images as well? Um, uh, I mean, it's, um, it's a very good question. And um, just the one that the image I started with, um, Simone said that the, actually, uh, you know, the, the birds are Indian, but the calligraphy is Iranian. So this this is perfectly sort of the case too that you know things that are illustrated in India but calligraphed not there and um, so uh, you know it, it's it's participating in various cultures and in in circulation um, I think um, of an object you know so and then paintings are painted over etc so um, I think it's very complex I don't know if, I mean we can talk about that but um, uh, you know it really um, uh, I think one should do this for at least the canonical text. That would be a very interesting case study of taking Firdosi, Saadi, Hafez, Jami, Amir Khosro, etc., and say, you know, how did this canon actually, you know, what manuscripts do we have? What can we say about text and image, etc., and movement of these uh, books in a certain time? That would be a, a nice collaborative study. Yeah. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.